Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by asking, who gets to decide when something is good or not? Who gets to decide when something is valuable or not? For example, there's a famous painting by the American artist Jackson Pollock that in 1973, the Australian government bought for $1.3 million called Blue Poles. Now this painting was extremely controversial at the time because of the record price that was paid for it. People were debating is this a work of art or not? Who gets to decide if this is worth it? Are all opinions of what is good or valuable equally valid? And so what about with issues more important than a mere painting, such as how we live our lives? Do we just decide for ourselves and hope that we're right, or at least that we're not too wrong in our decisions? Well, from the passage that we're looking at today, we'll see that it's never wrong to do what God thinks is good, or to value what he thinks is valuable. And we see here that in God's eyes, humanity is precious. We see in this story that's told to us that by healing on the Sabbath, Jesus shows everyone there listening how far their priorities are from God's. So in this passage, Jesus shows the Pharisees how far they have strayed from God's path. And in doing so, he also shows them why he himself is the servant that they had been promised. And yet at the same time, he took a step closer to his greatest act of service. So at the beginning of the passage, Jesus goes in to a synagogue. And there in the synagogue, in verse 10, we read, A man with a shriveled hand was there, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, it's interesting. The rabbis did permit healing on the Sabbath at that time if life was in danger. But where it was deemed that there was no immediate danger, there was not meant to be any healing either. However, it's the Pharisees here that are the ones that bring up the man with the shriveled hand. They're the ones who draw attention to this man. The man hadn't actually asked for healing when they asked Jesus about it. They weren't genuinely searching for information at this point. They asked so that they could accuse Jesus. So Jesus tells them this analogy about the sheep to show them how far they have strayed. In verse 11 and 12, he said to them, if any of you had a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Now, this time, the Jews in general, they showed great care for their animals. And they would take whatever action was necessary to deliver them from such a plight as the one that Jesus outlines here in this short parable. And the question that Jesus is asking them here, it's not simply rhetorical. There was actually active debate in Judaism at the time about this. For example, in the Qumran community, apparently, they were the most rigorous on this matter. And they had decreed that no one should help an animal give birth on the Sabbath day. And if he makes it fall into a well or a pit, he should not take it out on the Sabbath. That's how strict they were being in their rules about what could and could not be done, what help could or could not be given on the Sabbath. So for most people, 
Yes, it's okay to help animals on the Sabbath. But if people really are worth more than animals, and at least most people at that time and today would agree with this, at least in theory, if people really are worth more than animals, then shouldn't it be a good thing to help them too? For Jesus, human need was primary. Even though this man with a shriveled hand, even though his life was not in immediate danger, Jesus saw no reason why he should suffer one moment more. And there was apparently no comeback for those who objected. How could there be? And so Jesus turns his attention to the man and simply gives the command, stretch out your hand. He's commanding him here to do something that he shouldn't be able to do. Well, with his shriveled hand, he can't stretch it out. But in that instant, yes, he could, because the man's hand was restored, healed in a moment by Jesus' words. And so how do the Pharisees respond in verse 14 there? Well, Matthew shows us that the, the natural response to witnessing this healing on the Sabbath for them was to go out and to plan a murder on the Sabbath. How perverted and legalistic their idea of what is good must have been for this to be their response. They were completely blind to the fact that God had done a wonderful thing right in front of them for this formerly crippled man. So though there's vicious and unprincipled opposition to Jesus here, he stands his ground, standing up for what he knows is right, without the need to, to hit back, to fight, even though supposedly he easily could have done so. Because Jesus himself is the servant that they'd been promised. And here he is taking a step closer to his greatest act of service, his death on the cross and resurrection again for our sake. He knew what they were plotting, yet he also knew that it wasn't yet time. It says in verse 15, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place, a large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. Not only does Jesus heal all who come, but he warns, other, he warns them not to tell who he was. That's because the, the typical person in Israel at this time was hoping for liberation from the oppression of the Roman occupation. The fulfillment of the promise of a Messiah who would restore the kingdom of David to Israel in some way. And Jesus wants the people to see that his purpose is in coming. His role as the Messiah is not the same as their expectations. In fact, it's much greater. His purpose, as we see in verse 17, is to fulfill what Isaiah said. At the beginning of verse 18, we read, Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. Why delight in him? Well, we keep on reading to find out. In verse 19, the prophecy says, He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. Then, just like today, those who lead the nations are often the most forceful characters. Those with the loudest voices, those the most intent on getting their own way. And yet, 
Isaiah here is pointing out that God's servant, God's Messiah, doesn't fit this mould. It says that he's not going to quarrel. His mission is one of peace. This doesn't, of course, mean that he's not going to oppose evil. It means that he's able to do the Lord's work without unnecessary noise and publicity, puffing himself up, building up his own ego along the way. It says in verse 20, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. There are two important images here in this verse, verse 20, the image of the reed and of the wick. These are two things that, that normally would easily be thrown away. But with love and care, they can be made good and can still be of use. A reed was something that was commonplace. There were thousands of them that you could find all over the place. You could use them for all sorts of household tasks. And yet a bruised one, surely that's one that you can discard and just get another. One that you can be sure is going to stand up for the task. And... A wick that smoulders, one that while is a light gives out too much smoke, is one that's going to need a lot of care to be able to use properly. Surely you could just cut it off and put in a new one instead. And yet, here in this verse, we see how Jesus cares for all. that the lowliest of people are still of great importance and value to God, can still be used by God, can still do amazing things with God's help. And so in this passage, we see that opposition to the work of God's kingdom, well, it is real. Jesus was opposed to the religious leaders at the time. We're given this image of a spirit-endowed servant who does not quarrel or cry out, who deals gently with those who are hurting and the oppressed, but who doesn't waver in leading justice to victory. This This is a striking example of the balance of strength and gentleness, conviction and compassion, unwavering commitment to do what is right, and yet at the same time, humble servanthood that doesn't have to beat others down to be able to stand. However, those who are opposing Jesus, they couldn't recognise this. And why? Why could they not recognise the hand of God in Jesus' ministry? He had come as the messianic initiator of God's kingdom, and yet those who were most responsible for recognising him appear to be the most blinded when he is right in front of them. This should, I think, cause us to pause and consider as well. When we are faced with Jesus' role in our lives, are we ever more like the Pharisees, those people who are more willing to focus on what we think is good rather than what Jesus is showing us to be good. They should have recognised who he was and yet they were blinded by their preconceived ideas that all the evidence that they had right in front of them couldn't possibly point to the direction that it was, because in their minds it was impossible that Jesus could be the Messiah. They had these assumptions before they had looked at any of the evidence at all. It's easy for all of us to have preconceived ideas about God, about what he should value and what should be important to him. 
And so we need to think. We can all have preconceived ideas about what God should value, about what should be important to him. So what, what could be our preconceived ideas about Jesus, even if we do follow him? There's a quote from uh, the author, Anne Lamott, that uh, I find really helpful uh, in, this, in this topic. And she says that you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. I think there's something very insightful uh, about, about that quote. The idea that it's so easy for us to create God in our image. To be the small God that we want him to be. To agree with us. Rather than the God who is infinitely greater and infinitely better than any of our hopes, any of our values. Anything that we could come up with on our own. And thank God that it's never wrong to do what he thinks is good. And it's never wrong to value what he thinks is valuable. In this passage, Jesus has shown the Pharisees how far they have strayed. And yet at the same time, he's shown them why he himself is the servant that has been promised. And at the same time, he took a step closer towards what has wonderfully been his greatest act of service for our sake. So let's now pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for the reminder that it is that what you value that what you love is what we should seek to value and what we should seek to love as well. Father, we pray that our characters will be aligned more and more with who you want us to be. We pray that you will align our characters more and more with Christ, to be people who proclaim justice, be people who delight in knowing you and making you known. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.